Late 2017 has come to represent a year of sexual harassment allegations in both media and politics. The Iowa legislature was already reeling from a million dollar judgment regarding harassment. We sit down with the leader spearheading potential changes, Mary Kramer, on this edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation, the Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. I'm a dad. I am a mom. I'm a kid. I'm a kid at heart. I'm a banker. I'm an Iowa banker. No matter who you are, there is an Iowa banker who is ready to help you get where you want to go. Iowa Bankers, allowing you to discover the genuine difference of Iowa banks. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you politicians and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond. Now celebrating more than 40 years of broadcast excellence on statewide Iowa Public Television. This is the Friday, December 8 edition of Iowa Press. Here is David Yepsen. Every week seems to bring new sexual harassment allegations, new firings or resignations in the worlds of media and politics. This summer, an Iowa jury verdict of $1.75 million was awarded in a case in the Iowa Senate. Taxpayers are on the hook for that settlement. It's raising serious questions, and Senate leaders are under fire for mishandling the situation. In a search for answers, Republican leadership has turned to Mary Kramer, the former president of the Iowa Senate, a U.S. ambassador, and a longtime human resources vice president at Wellmark, joins us now at the Iowa Press table. Ambassador Kramer, welcome back to Iowa Press. Thank you. It's good to be here. Good to have you. And across the table, Aaron Murphy is Des Moines Bureau Chief for Lee Enterprises, and Kay Henderson is News Director at Radio Iowa. As a HR professional and as the former Senate President, when you were presented with instances of harassment during your tenure in the Senate, how did you handle them? Um, I could handle them as the HR person, and uh, I did. Uh, what was important, I think, was that people felt they could bring their, there was some place to take their issues. What's most difficult is if there is a culture that there is no trust or belief that anything will be done, that um, people don't come forward. And I, I guess I think that's the biggest change that's happened is that women who have come forward now in the last few months, maybe a year, people believe them. They have credibility. And so to me, it's an opportunity to be sure that a workplace has a safe place for people to report issues that they feel devalue them or disrespect them. Well, you hear phrases like boys club, and in the instance of this yes. um, lawsuit, which sort of brought all this about, um, toxic work environment was a phrase often used. How bad is it? I can't put a degree on it, but um, I thought it was not good when I was there. And um, I, I'm cross with myself a little bit that I did not institutionalize a human resources process at that time. I don't know whether it was time, I just don't know why that didn't occur to me that would have been helpful to do that. But I also realized that there is no boss at the Capitol. There's no one person in charge of either chamber or the media or the lobby. Uh, the House has a group, the Senate, all of that is, is fairly autonomous teams, to use that word loosely. And so how is it that we're going to get a common goal that we want a safe, respectful, productive workplace at the legislative branch of the Capitol? How do we get there? So, you know, at some point I'm saying, uh, it's not helpful for me to look back. We're not going that way. So let's look forward and say how we're gonna fix this. It is, it is a, in a business world, when you have a, 
so-called toxic culture. It's not a productive culture. So it's important to get it turned around so that it is a productive culture. And I think civility, respect, professionalism at the Capitol needs to be a stated goal. Ambassador, and you just said you don't want to look back, but just one more question to okay. look back a little bit. Uh, Senator Dix, who brought you in, um, waited until after this became a legal issue and was in the courts and there was a lawsuit before he investigated um, what was happening within his own caucus. Was that a mistake? Should he have been more proactive in his role in, as a leader? I think he would tell you that he thought he was pretty proactive, but n perhaps didn't take it... Um, to the extent that would have helped this. Would it have prevented this lawsuit? Who can say? But they did go to do training and they, you know, they tried to make some inroads. But I like the Chinese proverb that says, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. <laughs> and I don't think the students have been ready up until this point. <laughs> well, and, and the teacher has now appeared. So what are you going to tell them? What are, you, what are some of the recommendations you're going to make to legislators and leaders? I'm going to ask that there be a, a mission-wide, a legislative branch-wide resolution that states the goal of creating and maintaining a culture that is safe, respectful, and professional. And that everyone, the caucus staffs, there's four of those, the nonpartisan staff, which is a pretty good sized group of people, the staff of the Secretary of the Senate, the staff of the stated clerk of the House, the lobby, and the media are all engaged in understanding that's the goal and um, understanding what is the process for people to report when that goal is not met. And all caucuses, the Senate Democrats have sent you some letters yes. saying they wish to be involved in this. Yes, and I will meet with uh, Senator Peterson, uh, I think maybe next week, Her peop we're, we're working on that. Uh, because I think she does want to be engaged. That's so encouraging that we can... Uh, and it's hard to, for anybody to say we shouldn't do this. The House Speaker, Linda Upmeyer, has announced that she will be hiring a human resources professional yes. to handle these issues. Is that the person that you envision someone who has a complaint going to? Well, my... the if there's a normalcy to this, the normal thing would be for the person to go to their supervisor who is obligated to receive it and, and, and deal with it. That is uh, okay unless the supervisor is part of the problem. So if the supervisor is part of the problem, that next level up, then who? And so that would be one of the persons. And in this case, I think... Um, Senator Whitfer and Speaker Upmeyer and Senator Dix and Senator Representative Hagenau and I'm sorry I don't know everybody's name, but there would be because the the elected officials, I believe, think they are accountable to the people that elected them and nobody else. But if they are saying we are part of this culture, which they are then they also have to be part of this uh, this mission and this goal. And, and I'm sorry to, to clarify, because the House and the Senate have kind of been going their separate ways on this so far. So yeah. uh, are you recommending one HR professional to oversee both chambers? You said the lobbyists, the media, basically right. the, the entire capital. Well, I think they've had some really good discussion now about what level of HR person should that be. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of credentials should come with it? And what kind of responsibilities do you want to give? What does a job description look like? And uh, so there's, there's quite a bit of discussion about that right now, and they're in the interview process. Ambassador, uh, one... I'm mutually, sorry. yes, oh, David. One question I have about this episode. You know, the taxpayers are on the hook. Yes. 
$1.75 million yes, for are. actions done by other people, employees in, in the Senate, maybe some legislators. Uh, should the Attorney General seek to claw back that money from those people who are named in the report who did this stuff? Why should uh, someone commit an act like this without, and, and then all of a sudden the taxpayer is on the hook for it? I, I hear you talk about the taxpayer and the people who were part of this um, culture. Um, the goal for me is to prevent it from happening again. Right now, I don't know if I could say that it won't happen again. Um, although I think the, this made it vulnerable. Clawing back the money I, is a problem for me in that the people who are named, behavior isn't named, they were not personally sued. The Attorney General did not choose to um, handle that suit in any way except that the state is being sued and his people are trying it and that's what happens. So I have a question about, about this particular case. Mm -hmm. How would you write legislation? How would you find out any legal recourse to this? I think if you look at in what's going on in Washington right now, you have people resigning so they don't have to undergo an ethics investigation. Well, and Ambassador, you do have in Washington the discussion of whether taxpayers should be exactly. paying for this stuff. That's right. the question I'm asking about here. Yeah. Is if the Attorney General file a civil lawsuit and say, you, you employees did this on company time, uh, you're going to pay us back for this settlement. Um, I suppose the Attorney General could find a law that applied to that. Um, I think it's hard to sue people if the policy and the procedures are not clear. So going forward, should the policy and procedure be that you have personal liability in these that instances? That is potentially the case, that you would have personal liability. So will that be your recommendation? Yes. Legislation it in would. that regard? But um, having said that, having said that, keep in mind that when I was in the president's chair, I dealt with complaints that had to do with the lobbyists that had to do with the elected officials. By far, it was not limited to staff. As a matter of fact, I don't remember an issue at that point that was a staff issue. Mm -hmm. And in fact, is it the staff, the leader of that caucus, who is the supervisor of those employees? Is that the person? that should be personally liable for that. I don't, see, I don't see practices where I can look at that and say, here's a model mm -hmm. of how that works. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not shutting the door that it shouldn't happen, but I just, the complications of how that would work, um, in particular in a complex workplace like this, I, I'm just not, clear about it. So. Two Republican staffers, including the Secretary of the Senate, have written a, re a report that was dated August 15th um, to follow through on the complaints that uh, Kirsten Anderson made four and a half years prior to that. Um, one of the things from their report that happened is there was a, a lot of, of magic marker blacking out instances where people were named. Um, the legislature has passed a law that says when there's bad behavior on the path on the part of state employees, the public should be able to see that document. Why should the legislature not be subject to the same law? I expect they should. I think they they had in this initial session, they had the people that did the interviewing gave some indication there would be anonymity to those comments. Mm -hmm. And so now the question is, will that be the honorary part, or will there be some intervention based on the law that was passed? And I've, I have been on the edges of a little discussion of that, you know, how, how can we reconcile those two things? And so there's some discussion about it now. Um, what kind of discipline are we looking at here? What will your recommendations be if someone is 
um, you know, charged and, and an investigation reveals. Well, um, if I think if we find an if the investigation shows there has been that kind of behavior, the first thing is to indicate to that person that it's totally unacceptable. If it happens again, depending on who it is, if it's an employee, you can say if it happens again, you get terminated. If it's an elected official, I think, or a lobbyist, no, let's go one at a time. If it's an elected official, I think you have to say it, it gets filed with the Ethics Committee, which um, is bipartisan and, and transparent. Any filing with that is public. And then is it left up to was, the voters from that point? Then? Well, no, because the Ethics Committee has the capacity to discipline. And, and I think the hardest thing for an elected official would have that transparency to know that there's been an ethics charge filed, particularly in this environment. I think most elected officials will go to just about any length to avoid having that charge filed in the first place. I found that to be true even when I was the president of the Senate. There, well, have, there have been uh, cases where legislators were accused by the Ethics Committee. They took the, their case back to their voters and they got reelected. I right. mean, shouldn't ultimately the constituents be the ones exactly. who decide the fitness of somebody to serve in the body? Yes, but they deserve to have a pretty wide open picture of who that person is and what they... Uh, what behavior they've exhibited while they were serving. Yeah, so, yeah, but yes, the voter has the final say. The report that I mentioned earlier, drawn up by Charlie Smithson, the Secretary of the Senate, noted that there was some confusion among the Senate staff about what zero tolerance meant. Yes. Um, should there be confusion? Is anti harassment training effective? Mm. At this point, I would have to say, no, I don't think so. Is there effective training out there that they sh should use in the future? Go back to what I said about the student and the teacher. Um, a person has to recognize that they are putting themselves at risk before they're going to change. Now, truthfully, how could a person not know right now they're at risk, okay? <laughs> um, that maybe indicates another problem. <laughs> Neither here nor there. But my, my point there is, um, I think part of that mm, doubt is, when does something rise to the level of harassment? And so I guess I would rather right now see over-reporting. Let's hear what's going on. Because a lot of the things that pointed to that culture were quotes that people overheard other people saying. Right, talking about sex on the Senate floor, exactly. which is the place where you pass legislation and debate it in public. Right. Does so that I seem guess reasonable? It does, it does. And I think, and the person who says to me, well, I'm free to have any conversation I want. And absolutely right, but you are also then have to realize that there are consequences to those conversations. Right now, there aren't any consequences. Ambassador, I want to go to the larger issue that is, is uh, occupying us in America right now. Are we in a, a something of a sea change here with what's happening? I'm not talking just about in Iowa, but nationally and in the, the media industries. Uh, is this going to be a, a sea change, something that has lasting, permanent effects on behavior? I hope so. <laughs> I hope so, and I believe so. One of the reasons I agreed to do what I'm doing here is because I think it is a time that society is prepared to make some pretty significant changes. And some of these things that happened have created believers where there weren't any before. You know, it was just, as a, as a woman executive for many, many years, um, I had to think, okay, am, how much risk am I willing to take? Am I going to go out and really share this is what happened? Or am I going to find another alternative, which would be change companies, you know, find another way? Um, but I always felt it was on me, mm -hmm. and it was too big a career risk, particularly at the higher levels of companies. Um, 
to for me to run that up the flagpole, so to speak. Eric, D David alluded to this at the top. Every day, it seems, there's a new story that comes out. Yes. Um, have we gotten to the point where Vice President Mike Pence, for example, has a, a, a policy of not having private one-on-one -on -one meetings right. with, with a female? Is, do we need to go that far to, or, or, is the, or do you see that as an overcorrection? Over um, I don't. I think for him, it's an important thing, and he made that choice. Do I think everybody needs to make that choice? Probably not. On the other hand, I think we need to be really, let's define the difference between the workplace and your personal life. In politics, you almost don't have any personal life while you're in office. So just face it. And you know, you just face it. When you're on the Senate floor in the Iowa Capitol, it's a fishbowl. Everybody can see you and hear you. And in these days of cell phones, Record what you said. Be sure that you want that out there. It used to be the question, do you want to see yourself on the Des Moines Register? Yeah. So um, I guess, but what I'm saying is what we're doing here says, this is how you're, you need to behave in this workplace. I'm not asking you to change your belief. I'm not asking you to change your value. I am asking that you discipline your behavior in this workplace. But we have a female governor. If the Mike Pence rule were in effect, all but one of the Republican senators would not be able to have a private meeting with Governor Kim Reynolds. Correct. Correct. So that's what I say. It might be fine for him. But in reality suggests, especially for women executive and women leaders, that it would be a bit confining to say, I can't sit down with you one on one. Well, wouldn't it that's exclude women from yeah, being decision risk. makers? Yes. Pardon me? Excluding women from being decision makers. Well, but I still say if he wants to make that choice, that's his choice. Uh, every choice has consequences. That would not be a choice I would make because it would limit me right. from right. conducting and quite often my most effective work got done one-on-one -on -one, mm -hmm. uh, behind a closed door. Mr. Yepsen referred to the sea change that perhaps we're undergoing as a culture. Women have been in the workforce for decades. Yes. Um, Judy Bradshaw, who was the former uh, chief, chief of police here in Des Moines, said that women civilize men in the workforce. If that's true, um, how, how come it takes so long for that civilization process to take effect. How many people do you know that welcome change? <laughs> when you get the female at the executive table, and I can attest to this, for the first time, it's a sea change right then. I've had men use language which felt apparently okay before I got there, and then they wanted to say, oh, excuse me, Mary. I said, well, why would you excuse me? Shouldn't Mr. Yepsen be as offended as me by that language? So change is, we have to practice change. We've got just a few minutes left, Ambassador. What are the new rules, are there any rules for men? We've talked about women and what they should do uh, and what, what's happening to them, but what are the rules for men in the workplace? You mentioned don't do anything that you wouldn't want to see on the front page of a newspaper. All right, are there other rules now? Is Mike Pence rule keep keep the dis your distance uh what are the rules that you would recommend for men um yeah i think that's a really good question and something that we need to think about because i think many men are are feeling extremely vulnerable some of that's appropriate but i you can't get to the point where it's going to cause paralysis so what is that the idea is if it's a respectful workplace where we value the worker for what they produce rather than how they look or whether they want to go out and drink after work or whatever, the, the value, you know, if, if we value her for how she looks and she knows that, then how she dresses and how she behaves is one way. If we value her for her competence, that's a whole nother ball game. So I would say to men, if you're working with somebody 
then what you are, should appreciate is the work product and, and not how she looks or Best rule I have heard was you don't do anything with her to a woman that you wouldn't want somebody to do to your own mother, exactly. your wife, your daughter, yes. your sister. That, that's a yardstick. That's, that's a yardstick. And everybody has a mother. Not everybody has a wife. Not everybody has a daughter. Uh, but, you know, I have a son and a daughter, and I have four granddaughters, and now I have one great granddaughter. <laughs> and I view this now as the opportunity to give them a safe and respectful future in the workplace. Ambassador, thank you for being with us today. It's I'm good happy to see to. you again. Thank you. Thanks for it. And thank you for joining our latest edition of Iowa Press. We'll be back next week with another edition of the show at our regular air times, Friday night at 7.30 and Sunday at noon on our main IPTV channel with a rebroadcast on our Dot .3 World Channel Saturday morning at 8.30. For all of us here at Iowa Public Television, I'm David Yepsen. Thanks for joining us today. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation, the Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. I'm a dad. I am a mom. I'm a kid. I'm a kid at heart. I'm a banker. I'm an Iowa banker. No matter who you are, there is an Iowa banker who is ready to help you get where you want to go. Iowa bankers, allowing you to discover the genuine difference of Iowa banks.